Remember, all I'm offering is the truth, nothing more. What is the Trinity? Many skeptics seem to misunderstand this important doctrine of Christianity as a pagan idea or a modalist idea, but a brief explanation of the Trinity will explain that neither of these are correct. The core doctrine of the Trinity can be said in three sentences. There is one God, God is three persons, each person is fully God. This differs from a modalist understanding, which would say there is only one God who reveals himself in three different forms or persons, whereas the Trinity says there are three coexisting eternal persons who exist as one God. The Trinity also differs from a pagan grouping of gods who say there are three different gods who are simply one in purpose but are fully separate, whereas the persons of the Trinity are not different gods but one God. Most of those who misunderstand the Trinity tend to classify the Trinity as one of these, but they are both incorrect. The Trinity is not one God revealing himself as different forms, and the Trinity is not three different gods. The Trinity is one God who is three persons, and each person is fully God. The first person of the Trinity is the Father. He is the source of the Godhead and all things. He is transcendent, uncaused, beyond mere existence. He simply is. The second person of the Trinity is the Son, who is the Word of the Father. He is eternally begotten of the Father, uncreated, begotten, not made. His source is in the Father, and humans can approach the Father through the Son. The third person of the Trinity is the Holy Spirit, who is neither begotten nor created. He eternally proceeds from the Father. He is the active agent of God in the world and the guide of the Church. His source is in the Father as well, yet He has always existed. It is important to mention that the members interact with one another and the world. The Father sent the Holy Spirit like a dove onto the Son at His baptism. The Son sent the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. The Father created the world through the Son and the Holy Spirit. So there is present interaction within the Trinity. Now while the Father is the ultimate source, the Son and the Holy Spirit are not less in power or divinity. They are all eternal and all fully divine. They all coexist as one God, yet as separate persons of one undivided essence. They are eternally loving and love one another in perfect harmony. So there is no disagreement or division within the Trinity, because they share only one nature. A good but not perfect analogy has been likened to the sun. There is the star, the heat, and the rays. As long as the star has existed, it has been generating rays, and heat has proceeded from it. Likewise, as long as the Father has existed, he has been pouring out his being into the sun, and the Spirit has been proceeding from him. So it is important to understand what the Trinity is. There are three persons of one God, who coexist eternally as one God. Each is fully God and fully divine. The Holy Spirit and the Son submit to the Father's authority because there cannot be two masters. They find their source in Him, yet have always existed. So again, there is one God. God is three persons. Each person is fully God. Now, of course, there are many questions that stem from this. Is the Trinity taught in Scripture? Does it make logical sense? Well, we cover these topics in some other videos. For years, I've heard Christians struggle with explaining the doctrine of the Trinity. Likewise, I've heard atheists and people who believe in a Unitarian God attack the Trinity as confusing, illogical, and polytheistic. They often bring up the idea of God being Jesus, and the Father, and the Holy Spirit, yet all one being, doesn't seem to make sense. When I was agnostic, the Trinity didn't make much sense to me either. That was until I actually studied the concept of the Trinity, and the attributes of God. In research, I saw that the Trinity did make sense, but I also discovered that the existence of a Unitarian God is actually the concept that is illogical. Only a Trinitarian God can account for the unique attributes that make God who He is. First, let me start by saying that the doctrine of the Trinity begins with the belief that the true God is not totally comprehensible. Any God we could fully understand and explain, like a Unitarian God, would be an entity that is no greater than what we are. A Unitarian once told me that God was just a spirit. Well, if God is just a spirit, he would be no greater than the angels, since that is all the angels are. Lucifer may have had a chance in the war in heaven if God was just a Unitarian spirit, because God would be on the same level as Lucifer. But God created the angels, so he must be more than just a spirit. So how can we learn who God is? By simply studying his attributes. Every monotheistic religion claims that God is omniscient, well, if God knows all, then he must be able to see everything. 
And if God sees everything, then he must be everywhere at once, which would make God omnipresent. Now, if God is omnipresent, he would have to be greater than three dimensions, because three-dimensional beings and anything in the third dimension cannot be omnipresent. Therefore, for God to be omnipresent, he must be comprised of more than three spatial dimensions. Now, I'm not making this idea up. There are more spatial dimensions than the three we live in. At the end of the 19th century, they discovered the concept of hyperdimensions, which are realms that consist of more spatial dimensions than three. If God is omnipresent, he would have to consist of more than three dimensions and be hyperdimensional. How many dimensions does God consist of? Well, if you're going to take the Bible's word, then he is infinitely dimensional. Isaiah 40, 28 says, The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of all the earth. He never grows weak or weary. No one can measure the depths of his understanding. So what does God being hyperdimensional have to do with the Trinity? Well, allow me to explain. Hyperdimensions are not going to make sense to our finite minds. However, luckily, we can explain this using the example of taking a cube and trying to translate into a two-dimensional world. Take a look at this cube. Because we understand three dimensions, we understand the spatial parameters of this cube. But if we were to encounter a being living in a two-dimensional world, he wouldn't understand this cube at all. He would look at it and see it as just a square. We could then try to show him that it is actually a cube by turning it to show him another side. But his mind could not comprehend changes made in three-dimensional space. So to him, the change would look like this. The green square disappearing and the red square appearing. The two-dimensional being would then say, hey, that's a different cube. We would say, no, it's still the same cube. He would say, no, that can't be right, because I see a different square. And we would say, well, yeah, it's a different square, but it's still part of the same cube. We could then show him all sides of the cube and tell him that all six squares he saw were all one cube. Yet all he would see is six squares disappearing and appearing before him. He would not see the cube rotating from one side to the other, so he would not see the cube in its entirety or be able to imagine the physics and the shape of the cube because it exists in a higher dimension than he does. All he could do is trust our word that the six separate squares he saw were actually part of one object called a cube. So is this starting to sound familiar? This is exactly the same way God tries to explain himself to us. Clearly, he is omnipresent, meaning he is hyperdimensional and beyond three dimensions and beyond our spatial understandings. So God is explaining his form to us in hyperdimensional terms, where the physics allow beings to be more than one person. Yet we are still thinking in terms of three-dimensional laws, where all beings must only be one person. But since God is beyond the third dimension, he would have to be greater than it, meaning it would only make sense for him to be more than a Unitarian being, like we are. Now how monumental is this? Well, 2,000 years ago, they didn't have the science of hyperdimensions like we do today. So they came up with the term Trinity to try to explain to the world what God had told us about himself. This is absolutely monumental, because when man makes up a religion, he makes up a God he can understand and make sense of. Only in the Bible do we see a God that is beyond three dimensions and beyond the understanding capacity of humans. A hyperdimensional idea that was unknown to people 2,000 years ago. This is why I came to understand that other monotheistic religions have an illogical view of God. When you actually take the time to evaluate the idea of God, only the God of the Bible makes sense. So now this brings up another question. If you're watching this and believe in a Unitarian God, you might be asking, well, why is God only three persons? Why not five, or ten, or a million persons? Well, the answer is simple. He is revealed as three persons for our sake. Three is all that is needed for God to show us that he is everything we need. First, he is the Father. God who sits on the throne in heaven, holding the universe in his hands and watching over us from above. He is also revealed as the Holy Spirit. This is how God shows us he is always with us, surrounding us with his love and guiding us with his words, wisdom, and power. Last, God is manifested as Jesus Christ, God who became flesh to demonstrate his love for us by dying for our sins. Jesus is God who suffered in all our human struggles and manifested his love through action by dying on the cross. God is our Father, our guiding presence who is always with us, and our brother who suffered for our sins and saved us with his love. So unlike the Trinity, a Unitarian God cannot be a God that is all we need. 
A Trinitarian God is all those things, and therefore everything we could need. In conclusion, all monotheistic religions claim there is only one God, but only the God of the Bible can account for the unique attributes of God. For God to be omnipresent, he must be hyperdimensional. Religions that have a Unitarian view of God worship a God that cannot be omnipresent, and therefore not omnipotent. Only in the Bible do we see a God that is worthy of our praise and worship, and can account for the unique attributes that make God who he is. The Council of Nicaea Before this occurred, there were several different competing views of Christ. Then the Emperor Constantine assembled them all together to decide on one view of Christ. They met for days, fighting and bickering, until finally the current view of Christianity won, and the divinity of Christ was declared. Then the new Orthodox view used its power to stomp out and erase all other competing views of Christianity. <coughs> or so we're told. You know, I hear this story a lot from atheists, cults, Muslims, and several other non-Christian groups. They always give me this generic story to try to show me that the Council of Nicaea made up the divinity of Jesus and created a new version of Christianity. However, this is all I ever hear, this generic story. I never get any more details from skeptics, and there's a good reason why. Because when we study the details of what happened before, during, and after the Council met, this fable is easily debunked, and we see that Christ's divinity was not made up at the Council. So let's start with events that led up to the Council. On February 24th, in 303 AD, the worst persecution of Christians began under the Emperor Diocletian and lasted until Emperor Galerius finally issued a general edict of tolerance in 311 AD. Two years later in 313 AD, with the Edict of Milan, the Emperor Constantine finally legalized Christianity and allowed its practice. Now I want to stop here and make sure this point is clear. Constantine did not make Christianity the official religion of the empire. He simply commanded official tolerance of Christianity. He did, however, outlaw Jews from stoning Christians and gladiator shows, although they did persist until the 5th century. It wasn't until 380 AD, under the Emperor Theodosius, that Christianity was left as the only legal religion. Shortly after Christianity was made legal, a pastor from Alexandria named Arius began preaching the idea that Jesus was not God, but a created being. He gained a following and began disputing with Alexander, the Bishop of Alexandria. So in 321 AD, a local council declared Arius a heretic. However, Arius just moved to Palestine, where he gained a larger following, and over the course of the next few years, the debate became so intense that it gained the attention of Emperor Constantine. Constantine, who had just unified the empire, didn't want anything that would threaten division. He saw the debate between the Christians and Arians as a threat to the stability of the empire, so he moved to settle it. He officially called the council in 325 AD. There were no Gnostics involved, there were no Ebonites involved, or any other groups. The council was called to settle disputes between Christians and Arians only. Most other heretical views of Christianity, like Gnosticism, had mostly died out by this point, and the majority of those professing to be Christians were Orthodox Christians, so there was not a wide variety of different views of the council. Although Constantine originally invited over 1,800 bishops from across the empire, only around 300 were able to attend. Most of them were from the east, with only about a dozen representing the west. Now it should be remembered what happened to these men less than two decades ago. Most of them suffered through one of the greatest Christian persecutions of all time. Many of them faced brutal torture and imprisonment for their faith. So despite the modern view about the participants at the council, they were not the type of men who were fine with compromising their beliefs, especially if a few years earlier they were willing to die for them. These bishops actually assembled in Nicaea to confirm what they had already believed and deal with Arius' teachings. Now there were three parties at the council. The smallest was Arius and a handful of bishops that agreed with him, that the Father and Jesus were of different substance, or heterousius. The second and much larger group was the Orthodox group, led by Hoseas of Cordova and Alexander of Alexandria. Also in this group was the young deacon Athanasius. This group held the long-standing belief of the church that Jesus was fully God and had existed eternally with the Father. They said Jesus was of the same substance, or homoousius. Then there was a third group, roughly equal in size to the Orthodox group, called the Eusebian group, led by Eusebius of Caesarea. However, this group didn't differ on theology from the Orthodox view. They also believed Jesus was fully God and had existed eternally with the Father. They only differed on the use of the word homoousius. 
The reason is because in previous centuries, modalist heresies had used the word to teach that the Father and Jesus were one person and not coexisting persons of one being. So in actuality, the Orthodox group and the Eusebian group didn't differ on theology or the deity of Christ. They only differed on terminology. Now a big modern myth is that Emperor Constantine forced Trinitarian views on the church, but this simply is not historically supported. Although he presided over the council, he did not push any particular view. He was no theologian. All he wanted was that both sides would come to an agreement and there would be unity in the church. The Orthodox group listened to the views of Arius and they overwhelmingly rejected his views as being new and distant from the view of the church. Eusebius writes that some of the bishops tore up letters containing Arius' teachings. He then writes that church leaders interrogated Arius using scripture, but found he had a new way of interpreting every piece of scripture. They then pointed out that his views had to be wrong because it was new and it wasn't taught in any early church history. Athanasius rhetorically asked, how many fathers can you cite for your phrases? They then formed the Nicene Creed, which is a clear condemnation of Arius' teachings and a confirmation of the Orthodox view. In the end, all but Arius and two bishops signed the creed, clearly showing there was no major divisions in church theology. The council then moved to deal with other issues, such as which day to formally celebrate Easter. They formally denounced Gnosticism in other minor sects, publicized 20 canon laws, and dealt with other minor issues. The council did not decide on the biblical canon, the canon had evolved on its own over time. However, according to the Muratorian fragment, the canon was nearly complete by the end of the second century. The council did not decide on the use of the word Trinity. It dealt primarily with the divinity of Christ. The word Trinity can be found in early Christian history as it was used by early church fathers. An acceptance of a divine three can also be found in other early Christian writings. Now the results of the council did not actually please Constantine. In fact, he was very angry at the Christians. He wanted unity and compromise, not for one side to denounce the other. He actually took pity on the Arians. Arius was exiled and fled to Illyria for a short time, while his heresy began to spread and gain political power, especially when on her deathbed, Constantine's sister urged Constantine to support Arius, and he actually did. Arius found a new crafty way of interpreting the Nicene Creed in his favor, and Constantine invited him back so he could force the church to readmit him. However, Arius died before this could happen. A follower of Arius, Eusebius of Nicomedia, was able to sway Constantine more in favor of the Arian view. Just before his death, Eusebius of Nicomedia baptized Constantine, effectively symbolizing his siding with the Arians. After Constantine's death, the Arians continued to gain more ground against the Orthodox view. The Arian bishops that Constantine had favored used their political power to fight against Christianity. Constantine was succeeded by two Arian emperors in the east who worked with Arian bishops in an attempt to override Nicaea and write a new creed. Although Arians were still in the minority, they were given much more political power, which they used to try to stamp out Christianity. Many Christian leaders were forced into subscribing to creeds that did not favor either side. Jerome later described this time period as when the whole world groaned and was astonished to find itself Arian. However, despite the power of the Arians, one bishop fought back almost completely by himself. Athanasius of Alexandria continued to argue from scripture and stand against the might of the Arian heresy. Even when he was banished and removed from his position five times, he never swayed and stood for truth against the Arian political machine. He was a popular hero who prevented Christian theology from compromising and giving in to the Arians. So the Arians turned to gaining more political power. But just before the Arians completely consolidated their hold over the empire, they turned to internal fighting and destroyed themselves. It wasn't long before all their political power was lost, and the Christians were able to meet in 381 AD at the Council of Constantinople and reaffirm the Nicene faith. The battle between the Arians and the Christians did not end there. After the Council of Nicaea, many Arian bishops headed north and began converting the Germanic tribes to Arianism. They then eventually conquered the Western Roman Empire, and the Christians had to deal with Arianism again. However, as we can see today, Arianism died out, and Christianity is still going strong and growing. So as you can see, Christian bishops did not inherit absolute political power from the Council of Nicaea and use it to stomp out other competing sects. On the contrary, it was the Arians who gained the political power and tried to stomp out the true church. So there is no evidence the Council created Christianity, the concept of the Trinity, or the divinity of Jesus, or use political power to erase other competing sects. This myth about the council is a complete fairy tale. 
It astonishes me how many non-Christians used the Council of Nicaea to try to claim Christianity was made up in 325 AD, when historically there is just no evidence for it. Many skeptics are constantly telling me that there is no teaching of the Trinity in the New Testament, and as a Christian when I hear this, I just roll my eyes. Saying the Trinity is not in the Bible is like saying your car doesn't have an engine. Just open it up and you'll see that it's in there. So in this video, I'm going to point out the obvious and refute objections made by Unitarians that the Trinity is not in the New Testament. The biggest objection I hear from Unitarians is that the Bible never says the word Trinity. Well, the Bible never says the word omnipresent either, but no one claims that means the Bible says God isn't. The Bible never says the word omniscience, but no one says that means the Bible says God is not all-knowing. The Bible never says the word Unitarian, but that certainly doesn't stop skeptics from thinking God is a Unitarian being. These words were made up at a later date to describe a concept in the Bible. Likewise, just because the word Trinity is not in the Bible, that doesn't mean that there isn't a teaching of it. There is a clear understanding of one God who is three distinct persons throughout the New Testament, and most skeptics will simply cherry pick verses to say God is not a Trinity. Now there are places where the three persons are mentioned together and are distinct from one another. Matthew 3, 16-17 says, When he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Matthew 28, 19 says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Now many skeptics will say this verse was added later, but there is no good evidence this is the case. The idea this verse was added later is nothing but a conspiracy at this point, since several early church fathers quote it, and no manuscripts have been found without it. So moving on, we also see the Trinity in Titus 3, 4-6. But when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. Now I could go on, but these verses are just mentioning the three persons of God. Most Unitarians do not deny that the New Testament mentions all three persons. They deny that the Holy Spirit and Jesus Christ are both eternal and fully God existing with God the Father. However, this is easy to refute. The New Testament says Jesus and the Holy Spirit are both fully God and both eternal. We'll start by looking at the Holy Spirit. In Acts 5, 3 and 4, we see that Peter directly calls the Holy Spirit God. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. Verse 3 says that Ananias lied to the Holy Spirit. But the very next verse says Ananias lied to God. So Peter calls the Holy Spirit God. In other passages, we also see the attributes of God applied to the Holy Spirit. Hebrews 9.14 says the Holy Spirit is eternal. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit, offered himself without spot to God? 1 Corinthians 2.10 says the Spirit is omniscient. But God has revealed them to us through his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. So according to the scriptures, the Holy Spirit is eternal and is omniscient. Now some skeptics say the Holy Spirit is just a force from God, but there are verses where the Holy Spirit speaks and does more than a force is capable of doing. Acts 13.2 says the Holy Spirit speaks and commands. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Paul later says in Romans 8.27, the Holy Spirit has a mind. So clearly the Holy Spirit is more than a force, has attributes of God, and is directly called God. So the Holy Spirit is God, yet distinct from the Father, who is also God. Now what most skeptics argue is that Jesus isn't God and never claimed to be. They constantly say there is no verse in the Bible where Jesus says he is God. Well actually, yes there is. In fact there are several. Skeptics are looking for a verse where Jesus says, I'm God. And if Jesus was talking to modern English speakers, that is exactly what he would say. But he was talking to ancient Jewish people. And if Jesus said, I'm God, it wouldn't mean he was claiming to be the eternal almighty God of heaven. In John chapter 10, 
Jesus quotes Psalm 82 6 to show that if one claims to be God, it doesn't mean one is claiming to be the eternal creator. For the ancient Jews, if one called himself the personal name of God, he was committing blasphemy by claiming to be the Lord. And that is exactly what we see. In John 8:58, Jesus says, before Abraham was, I am. Jesus says he is, I am, which indicates a correlation to Exodus 3:14, when God said to Moses that he was, I am who I am. Now many skeptics say there is no correlation and Jesus was just saying he existed before Abraham. But this is not what the verse says. Jesus uses this phrase to contrast between Abraham's beginning with his own lack of beginning. In other words, Jesus was unlike Abraham, having been brought into existence, whereas Christ just always is and has a continual present existence. This is brought out more clearly in the Greek words used, genesthē and ami. Robert M. Bowman Jr. says, the aorist genesthē came into being, used of Abraham, is contrasted with the present, ami, which can express duration up to the present. I have been and still am, as well as in the simple present, I am. Jesus claims that his mode of existence transcends time, like God's, and his I am is understood by the Jews as a claim to equality with God. If Jesus was simply saying he existed before Abraham, he would have said ego e barco. In saying ego a me, he was saying he just exists without a past beginning, unlike Abraham who had a beginning. This is why the Jews wanted to stone him in the next verse, because Jesus said he was the Lord. Now this is not the only place we see Jesus claiming to be the I Am. There are other instances throughout the book of John. Jesus also claims to be God in the other Gospels. Although it is not apparent in the English, in the Greek, Jesus makes the claim to be the great I Am as well. When Jesus walked on water in Matthew 14, 27, it reads, But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I. Do not be afraid. In all three of these passages, in the Greek, Jesus says, Ego ami, I am. So the verse says in Greek, Be of good cheer, I am. Do not be afraid. So we have several verses where Jesus claims to be the eternal God. Also, Jesus constantly referred to himself as the Son of Man. Now some skeptics say this is Jesus affirming his humanity by calling himself a son of man. But actually the opposite is true. In Daniel chapter 7, a divine figure known as the son of man is said to have an everlasting kingdom and is riding on the clouds of heaven. And when Jesus was brought before the Sanhedrin in Mark 14, Jesus quotes from Daniel 7 to show he is the divine figure mentioned. Again, the high priest asked him, saying to him, are you the Christ, the son of the blessed? Jesus said, I am, and you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. So when Jesus called himself Son of Man, he was actually referring to himself as the divine figure in Daniel 7. The other interesting thing about this is that in the Old Testament, the act of riding on the clouds is exclusive to God only. So not only is Jesus claiming divinity, he's claiming he will do something that is reserved only for God. Jesus also did things that only God can do like accept worship and forgive sins. In Matthew 9 we read, Then behold, they brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, be of good cheer, your sins are forgiven. And at once some of the scribes said within themselves, This man blasphemes. But Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Why do you think evil in your hearts? For which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven you? Or to say, Arise and walk but that you may know that the Son of Man has the power on earth to forgive sins. Now the Bible says only God can forgive our sins, but Jesus claimed he also had that authority. So I think it is clear, the New Testament says the Father is God, the Holy Spirit is God, and Jesus Christ is God, and they are all distinct from one another. This is most apparent in John 14, 26. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things I said to you. Besides this verse and the others I already mentioned, there are several verses that show the distinction and the coexistence of all three members of the Trinity. So they are not different modes of one God. Now some skeptics take this distinction too far to say there are three separate gods, but that is inconsistent with the rest of the New Testament, which says there is only one God, not three. Plus we see the three members of the Trinity acting as one. In John 14:17. Jesus says after he leaves, the spirit of truth will come and live in them. 
But in verse 21, Jesus says he will manifest himself in us. But then in verse 23, we read it is actually the Father who will come with Jesus to live in us. So who is coming to live in us? The Holy Spirit, Jesus, or the Father? It is obvious all three are acting as one and are one, just as the New Testament has been telling us. So as it is clearly seen, there is a strong teaching of the Trinity in the New Testament, and I barely covered the evidence. I didn't mention the book of Revelation, and I barely touched on the evidence in the Gospels. So the only way to deny the Trinity is to deny the New Testament, because it is obviously clear, even without mentioning 1 John 5, 7, the New Testament teaches that God is triune in his nature. Is there any evidence of the multi-personal God known as the Trinity in the Old Testament? Was this concept of God made up by early Christians? Or can we see this teaching of a multi-personal God existing in the Old Testament long before the rise of Christianity? Many Unitarians say no, that the Trinity was made up by early Christians, and there is no evidence of it in the Old Testament, and no evidence that early Jews believed in anything but a Unitarian God. They often point to Deuteronomy 6.4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Unitarians say this verse clearly refutes the idea of any plurality within the Godhead and shows God's nature is Unitarian. But is this how the verse was meant to be interpreted, with the surrounding context and with the unique words used in the verse? Many Christian scholars say no and provide ample evidence as to why. First, Deuteronomy 6.4 is a very short statement, and the surrounding context doesn't give any more clarification to imply the verse is definitely talking about the internal nature of God. In fact, the opposite is true. The surrounding context implies the verse is intended to contrast the Lord to the possibility of other gods existing with him, such as pagan grouping of gods, in which three individual gods are in close related association with one another. A few verses down in verse 13 and 14, we read, You shall fear the Lord your God and serve him, and shall take oaths in his name. You shall not go after other gods, the gods of the peoples who are all around you. So the context implies verse 4 is saying the Lord is one being, in contrast to early pagan grouping of gods. Second, the words used in Deuteronomy 6.4 do not prohibit the idea of a multi-personal God. The word used for one is a cod. Now a cod does simply mean one, but it doesn't absolutely mean solitary or entirely singular. Messianic scholar Dr. Michael Brown says, actually, a cod simply means one exactly like our English word one. While it can refer to compound unity, just as our English word can, as in one team, one couple, it does not specifically refer to compound unity. On the other hand, Akkad certainly does not refer to the concept of absolute unity, an idea expressed most clearly in the 12th century by Moses Maimonides, who asserted that the Jewish people must believe that God is Yakid, as only one. There is no doubt that this reaction was due to exaggerated unbiblical Christian beliefs that gave Jews the impression that Christians worship three gods. Unfortunately, the view of Maimonides is reactionary and also goes beyond what is stated in scripture. In fact, there is not a single verse anywhere in the Bible that clearly or directly states that God is in absolute unity. Akkad is used in Genesis 2.24 to say a man and his wife shall become one flesh. So Akkad is used to say two are together one. Genesis 11.6 says, The people are one, and they all have one language. Obviously the people are all individuals, but the word Akkad is being used to show they are working together as one. So since Akkad can be used to describe multiple things as one, why does Akkad in Deuteronomy 6.4 have to mean God is a Unitarian being? Also, the verse uses a word for God that ends in a plural possessive pronoun suffix. Other words ending this way can be seen in Numbers 20.15, Isaiah 53 5 and 1 Samuel 12 19. This shows the word used for God is plural and not singular. So since a plural name is used for God, many Christians argue this verse can easily be translated like this. Which shows us that once we understand the original meaning of the words used, we can see that the verse does not favor Unitarianism. Many other examples of plural names and pronouns are used throughout the Bible when speaking about God. However, I agree with skeptics that this evidence alone is not enough to show a multi-personal God in the Old Testament. It is good evidence, but it isn't sufficient on its own, since there are other good alternative explanations as to why plural names and pronouns are used for God, which is why I point to the evidence of the three divine persons in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, the three persons of God are the Father, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. But in the Old Testament, we also see three persons of God, who are the Lord, the angel of the Lord, and the spirit of the Lord. 
Now, no one is going to dispute the first one. Clearly, the Old Testament says the Lord is God and a father to his people. What Unitarians dispute is the other two claims, especially the angel of the Lord. And while I agree that the phrase angel of the Lord could at times be referring to an ordinary angel, there are several passages where the context clearly shows this angel is the divine God and yet distinct from another divine being who is also God. Now, there are several passages where the angel of the Lord is mentioned. A few only mention him in passing, and only about nine show a clear distinction between the Lord and the angel of the Lord, but do not give any details about the angel. But these other 11 passages clearly show the angel of the Lord is a divine figure and has the authority that only God should have. On top of that, three of these passages also show that this divine figure is also distinct from another divine being who is also God. Now before I continue, the important thing to remember is the word for angel in Hebrew doesn't mean a winged being of heaven. It actually just means messenger or representative. For example, in Genesis 32.3, when Jacob sent messengers to Esau, the Old Testament uses the same word that it uses for angel. So we have to study the context of each passage to understand who the angel of the Lord is and not just put our modern cultural defining of words onto the text. So let's take a look at a few of these passages. Genesis 16 is a story of what happened when Hagar fled Sarah and the angel of the Lord appeared to her. The angel of the Lord said to her, Return to your mistress and submit yourself under her hand. Then the angel of the Lord said to her, I will multiply your descendants exceedingly, so that they shall not be counted for multitude. If the angel of the Lord is just an ordinary angel, then why does he say he will multiply her descendants? He doesn't say God will multiply her descendants. He says he will do it. Verse 13 says, Then she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees. For she said, Have I also here seen him who sees me? The Genesis author clearly says the Lord spoke to her. But verse 9 and 10 say the angel spoke to her. So the author clearly identifies the angel of the Lord as the Lord himself. Hagar even says she has seen the God who sees her. Let's look at another passage. One of my personal favorites, Exodus 3, when God appeared to Moses in the burning bush. Starting in verse 2 we read, And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in the flame of the fire from the midst of the bush. So he looked, and behold the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Then Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush does not burn. So when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses, and he said, Here I am. Here we read the angel of the Lord appeared in the burning bush. And then two verses later we read that God called Moses from in the bush. So obviously the angel of the Lord is the Lord. Now some skeptics say God was just speaking through the angel. But that is inconsistent with verse 16, which says, Go and gather the elders of Israel together, and say to them, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and Jacob, appeared to me. God says, He appeared to Moses. But verse 2 says, The angel of the Lord appeared to Moses. So clearly the angel of the Lord is God. The interesting thing about this passage is, the angel says his name is, I am who I am. He is saying that he is the existing one the timeless being whose existence depends on no one. So the angel of the Lord says he is not a created being. He is the existing one, which is why Jesus says in John 8:58, before Abraham was, I am, clearly showing that Jesus or the angel of the Lord claimed to be the existing one whose existence is dependent on no one else. Now many skeptics can turn this around and say, well, there's no distinction between the angel of the Lord and the Lord. These verses are just showing God appearing in the form of an angel. However, I already mentioned there are other passages where there is an undeniable distinction between the Lord and the angel of the Lord. Plus, there are no passages in the Old Testament where the phrase angel of the Lord appears and the surrounding context implies it as an ordinary created angel. But there is also passages where the angel of the Lord is divine and yet distinct from another divine being. Take a look at Genesis 22, 10-12. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. So he said, Here I am. And he said, Do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Here the angel of the Lord says, Not withheld your son from me. Showing the angel is the God, in verse 1, who said he would test Abraham. But the angel of the Lord also says, For now I know that you fear God. In a single sentence, the angel of the Lord distinguishes between himself and another he refers to as God, while at the same time identifying himself as the God who said he would test Abraham. 
We can also look at Zechariah 3. Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to oppose him. And the Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord has chosen Jerusalem. Rebuke you. Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? Here, the angel of the Lord is identified as God once more. But then to rebuke Satan, the angel says, The Lord rebuke you. Why doesn't the Lord just say, I rebuke you? This is showing that the Lord, known as the angel of the Lord, is distinct from another divine figure who is also Lord. It is similar to Psalm 45, 7. Therefore God, your God, has anointed you. This verse and Zechariah 3, 2 both show us that there are two distinct persons who are both God, which also explains why there is so much plurality in the Old Testament like we see in Deuteronomy 6, 4. But it is also very Trinitarian sounding, showing there are distinct persons who are both fully God. Now there is a third person of God in the Old Testament, known as the Spirit of the Lord, and he is very similar to God the Holy Spirit in the New Testament. In 1 Samuel 10, it says Saul went up to meet a group of prophets. Then the Spirit of God came upon him, and he prophesied among them. This is similar to the events in the book of Acts, when the Holy Spirit came upon the apostles, and they began to speak in tongues and prophesy. There are also verses where it says the Spirit of the Lord entered into people, which is what Christ and Paul said the Holy Spirit did when you accepted Christ as your Savior. In fact, the term Holy Spirit was not invented in the New Testament. It is used in the Old Testament in Psalm 51 and Isaiah 63. In Isaiah 63, the term Spirit of the Lord and Holy Spirit are used interchangeably, but we also see that the Holy Spirit is distinct from God. Isaiah 63, 11-12 says, Where is he who put his Holy Spirit within them, who led them by the right hand of Moses with his glorious arm, dividing the waters before them to make for himself an everlasting name? So here, we see the Holy Spirit is mentioned by name in the Old Testament and is distinct from God. We also see distinctions in other passages as well between the Spirit of the Lord and the Lord. Ezekiel 11.5 says, Then the Spirit of the Lord fell upon me and said to me, Speak, thus says the Lord. Thus you have said, O house of Israel, for I know the things that have come into your mind. Here the Spirit came to Ezekiel with a message from the Lord. Psalm 104.30 says, God sends his Spirit. So there is a clear distinction between the two. But in 2 Samuel 23, we see that when the Spirit speaks, it is actually God speaking. Verse 2 and 3 say, The Spirit of the Lord spoke by me, and his word was on my tongue. The God of Israel said. In this passage, it doesn't say God is speaking through the Spirit. It says when the Spirit speaks, God is speaking. In Job 33, 4 we read, The Spirit of God has made me, and the breath of the Almighty gives me life. The verse says the Spirit made him, but only God can give life. Therefore, the Old Testament teaches that the Spirit of the Lord is also God. Now, my favorite Trinitarian verse in the Old Testament is Isaiah 48, 16, because it puts all members of the Trinity together. Come near to me, hear this. I have not spoken in secret from the beginning. From the time that it was, I was there. And now the Lord God and His Spirit have sent me. Here, the Lord is speaking about His eternal nature, but then says there are two distinct separate persons known as the Lord and His Spirit who are sending Him. In one verse, we see the entire teaching of the Trinity, three separate divine beings who are all God. Now, I want to let my viewers know the information I presented here is only a fraction of the evidence. I certainly cannot cover everything without making a video over two hours long, but I want to give people a starting point to see that like the New Testament, in the Old Testament, there are three distinct persons of God, known as the Lord, the Angel of the Lord, and the Spirit of the Lord. All are distinct from each other and all are fully God. Not only that, but there were ancient Jewish authors who also noticed the different persons of God. Philo of Alexandria, for example, differed with Christianity a little and argued that the Hebrew scriptures taught that there were two separate gods who made creation, since God was deemed untouchable in all ways. According to Philo, the world was created by extensions of God, known as the Spirit of the Lord and the Memor of the Lord, which translates in Greek to the Logos, which translates in English to the Word. In Volume 2 of Answering Jewish Objections to Jesus, Dr. Michael Brown presses this case and shows that the Old Testament shows that the angel of the Lord is also referred to as the Word of the Lord. So when John wrote his Gospel and said in the beginning was the Word, he wasn't the first to call the second member of the Trinity the Word. However, this topic would take way too long for me to get into now. But I think it is clear that the fraction of the evidence I covered clearly shows Unitarianism is not in the Old Testament. 
there is overwhelming evidence of a multi-personal God who is three distinct persons in the Hebrew Scriptures. And clearly, this concept was not introduced by Jesus and his apostles. In the previous two videos, we looked at how the triune God is taught in the Old and New Testament. So now we're going to look at some objections from Scripture that Unitarians bring up and deal with them appropriately. The first objection comes from Proverbs 8. In this chapter, Solomon is speaking how glorious wisdom is, but many Unitarians point out that wisdom is being spoken about as if wisdom is an actual person. They then draw a parallel to John chapter 1, where Christ is called the Word, and say that the personification of wisdom in Proverbs 8 is actually Jesus. And Proverbs 8.22 says wisdom was created. So Jesus cannot be the eternal God since it directly says he was created. However, despite this claim being an obvious leap by Unitarians, there are other problems with the idea this chapter is about Jesus. The first thing to note is the word Unitarians interpret as create doesn't necessarily mean create. The Hebrew word used when God creates is bara, but here we see a Hebrew word which can be used to mean several things, like possess or own. So it is not explicit that God created something or someone here. Also, there's not enough evidence this passage is even talking about Jesus. If we conclude that wisdom is an actual being, rather than a mere personification of a virtue, then we would have to conclude that prudence is also a being. Verse 12 says, I wisdom dwell with prudence. We should also conclude that instruction is a being as well. Proverbs 4.13 says, Take firm hold of instruction, do not let go, keep her, for she is your light. If wisdom is understood to be a created being because it is personified, then we have to conclude that every time Solomon personifies a virtue, he is speaking of a created being. In actuality, Solomon uses poetic personification for the desirableness of wisdom so he can compare it to the desirableness of women. That is why wisdom is personified and given feminine pronouns, and this is not uncommon in the Jewish literature. In the Bible, there are other places where abstract qualities are personified following an ancient Eastern tradition of personification. Larry W. Hurtado says, the idea of wisdom being an independent deity here is simply unwarranted and imports into such passages connotations never intended by the writers. So the next objection comes from Acts 20:28. 20, it says, therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Now the Holy Spirit didn't purchase us with His blood, Jesus did. So does this verse teach modalism and show that Jesus and the Holy Spirit are the same person? No, but this is a good example of the difficulties translators face. The He in Greek is referring to God or Lord, not the Holy Spirit. His own blood can equally be translated as the blood of His own. So in the Greek, this verse is not modalist. Now another objection I hear is regarding my video on the Trinity in the Old Testament. I make the claim that the figure known as the angel of the Lord is the person of Christ in the Old Testament. Yet in the New Testament, the phrase angel of the Lord is used to refer to ordinary angels. So can we be sure the angel of the Lord is actually a person of God in the Old Testament? Yes, because it's not about the phrase, it's about the surrounding context. Furthermore, the New Testament was written in a different time period to a different audience in a different language. So the phrase will obviously not be used the same way it was in the Old Testament. What about Acts chapter 7? Verse 30 says an angel appeared to Moses in the burning bush. Stephen doesn't say it was God who appeared to Moses. Well, like Hebrew, the word for angel simply means messenger. It doesn't specifically mean angel. But also, Stephen never implies or explicitly says God was speaking through an ordinary angel. In fact, in the next two verses, he says God spoke to Moses in the bush, and Moses dared not to look which means that both Stephen and Moses understood God appeared to him, since Moses was afraid to die from seeing God. Moreover, in verse 38, Stephen says that the angel who appeared to Moses in the bush was also the figure who was with Moses on Mount Sinai. So Stephen doesn't contradict Exodus 3 and say it was an ordinary angel that appeared to Moses. He just is not as explicit as the passage he is quoting. What about the book of Jude? Verse 9 says Michael was disputing with Satan and said to him, The Lord rebuke you which seems to indicate that Jude was quoting Zechariah 3 and saying that the angel that Zechariah saw rebuke Satan was actually Michael and not God himself. Well, actually, this is not the case. Jude is referring to an Apocrypha book known as the Assumption of Moses. He doesn't mention important figures from Zechariah 3, like the high priest Joshua or the prophet Zechariah. So Jude is not referring to Zechariah 3. 
He might be borrowing language, but there is no evidence to say he is quoting it. Now some skeptics try to make the claim that Jesus and Michael the Archangel are the same being, but I find this hard to believe because there's no implication in scripture and Hebrews 1 directly contradicts the idea that an angel can be the son of God. Verse 5 and 6 say, For to which of the angels did he ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. But when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, Let all the angels of God worship him. So Jesus cannot be a created angel because angels are not the children of God. And just so my viewers know, the author defines angels here specifically as ministering spirits. So it is explicit he is talking about actual angels and not just messengers of some sort. Another verse used to say Michael and Jesus are the same is 1 Thessalonians 4.16, which says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. However, this verse does not explicitly say Jesus is an archangel. First off, skeptics are completely ignoring the power of the preposition with. This Greek preposition is usually used to denote accompanied by someone or something. It is not used to describe. For example, it would be used if I would say in Greek, I'm with my family. It would not be used to say, I'm filled with joy. On top of that, the structure of the sentence is worded in such a manner that when Christ returns, he will be accompanied with these things. If the voice of the archangel is Jesus' actual voice, then we also have to conclude that the trumpet of God is also describing Jesus, since it uses the same Greek preposition and sentence structure. But that wouldn't make sense in Greek or English. Besides, 2 Thessalonians 1 7 says Jesus will be revealed from heaven with angels. So it seems Jesus is coming with angels, not that he is coming as an angel. What about Jesus being called the firstborn? Does this imply he was born at some point? No, because if you look at Colossians 1, we see that Paul teaches Jesus is the firstborn in privilege, not first created. Plus, the Greek word used for firstborn doesn't mean oldest child, it means priority. In ancient cultures, the firstborn was not necessarily the oldest child. Firstborn referred not to the birth order, but to the rank. The firstborn possessed the inheritance and leadership. So in Jesus being the firstborn, it doesn't mean he is the first created. This is why understanding the language and the culture the Bible was written in is very important. Now what about things Jesus said and did during his ministry? Doesn't Jesus pray to the Father? So was Jesus praying to himself? No, because prayer is defined as talking with God. And since the persons of the Trinity are not different modes of one God, there is nothing incoherent about one member of the Trinity talking to another. So Jesus was simply praying or talking with the Father. Doesn't Jesus say the Father is greater than him in John 14, 28? Yes, but that doesn't mean the Father is greater in power or essence. The Greek word for greater can be used to mean greater in quantity, essence, or position. And there are several passages where Jesus claimed to be equal with the Father in essence. Jesus is pointing out the same thing Paul points out in 1 Corinthians 11:3, that Jesus willingly submits to the Father in rank. And there is nothing odd about Jesus submitting to the Father's leadership. Two persons cannot lead, and there is nothing incoherent about the Father being the lead and the Son submitting to his leadership and position. St. John Chrysostom said concerning this, If anyone say that the Father is greater insofar as he is the cause of the Son, we will not gainsay this. But this, however, does not make the Son to be of different essence. So John 14, 28 says the Father is greater in position, not essence, which is in line with the rest of Scripture. It is also important to remember that Hebrews 2.9 says that Christ was made lower than the angels when he was made human. Philippians 2.5-7 says Jesus was equal with God, but willingly became a man, humbled himself, and became obedient, showing that while Jesus was on earth, he was dependent on the Father since he had to cooperate with the limitations of being human. After his resurrection, he was once again fully divine. So many other objections can be answered by a misunderstanding of Jesus' hypostatic union and that he cooperated with the limitations of being human. Now obviously there are dozens of other objections to the Trinity, and we certainly cannot cover them all, but the most frequently used objections can be easily dealt with, as I have just done. And I want to point out that if someone claims the Bible teaches Unitarianism, then the burden of proof is really on them, because they first have to explain away the countless verses I've already used to show that the Trinity is in the New Testament and in the Old Testament. In continuing this series, we are showing how the Triune God is taught throughout Scripture. Yet many skeptics object to this and point to verses they think shows that Jesus isn't God. 
so we're going to take a look at some of these and refute their claims. The first verse they like to use is Mark 10:18, which they claim shows that Jesus denied being good and God. Here, Jesus is responding to a rich man who calls him good teacher and asks what he must do to inherit eternal life. Jesus replies, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Now the obvious thing here to note is Jesus never says, I am not good and I am not God. He asks the man if he realizes what he is saying. Skeptics are taking this question as if Jesus was making a statement about himself, but that is obviously not what is happening. Jesus was trying to get the man to think about what he was saying by calling him good teacher. Jesus takes this phrase to teach a lesson about what is truly good and show that no man, apart from God, can be good on his own works, since that was the reason the man was there in the first place, trying to see if he was good enough to enter into heaven. Jesus replied by pointing out that to be good meant to be equal with God, and if he truly believed Jesus was God. But there is no point at which Jesus denies being good. He only gets the man to realize that to call someone good means to call them God. In fact, later in John's Gospel, Jesus says he is the Good Shepherd. So if only God is good, and Jesus says he is the Good Shepherd, then we can easily see that Jesus calls himself God, and Mark 10.18 only helps confirm that. John MacArthur says, Jesus challenged the ruler to think through the implications of ascribing to him the title good. Since only God is intrinsically good, was he prepared to acknowledge Jesus as deity? By this query, Jesus did not deny his deity. On the contrary, he affirmed it. Another verse is John 17.3, where Jesus prays to the Father and says, And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Skeptics argue that if Jesus says the only true God is the Father, then he himself cannot be the only true God. Therefore, Jesus isn't God. However, once again, we have a case of skeptics claiming Jesus said something he didn't. Jesus never said, I am not God. He says the Father is God. And this doesn't contradict the doctrine of the Trinity. As we said in our previous video, each person is fully God. They are not separately a third of God. The Father is the true God, the Son is the true God, and the Holy Spirit is the true God. They do not add up to one God, they are each fully God. The only true God exists in more than one person, so the members of the Trinity are the true God, individually or collectively. When the Son says the Father is the true God, it is no different than when the Father says in Hebrews the Son is Lord. You, Lord, laid the foundations of the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment. Like a robe, you will roll them up. Like a garment, they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years have no end. The context around John 17:3 also shows Jesus is divine. If we look at the entire verse, it says eternal life is getting to know the Father and Jesus Christ, not just the Father. So eternal life is getting to know both God and Jesus Christ, meaning eternal life comes from both, which is a claim to be equal with God, which is also what we see in the prior verse. Verse 2 says Jesus gives eternal life, and verse 5 says Jesus was in glory with the Father before the world was created. Remember, the doctrine of the Trinity says that Jesus finds his source in the Father and submits to his authority. Nothing here in John 17 contradicts that. It does, however, contradict the possibility for modalism. So the next verse we will look at is Matthew 12:32, which says, And whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. If Jesus is equal to the Holy Spirit, then shouldn't the sin against the Holy Spirit be equal with the sin against Jesus? Well, it seems skeptics take this verse out of context. What Jesus is saying is the only unforgivable sin is unbelief. We have to remember the context here. The Holy Spirit is the active agent in the world for the triune God. Like the Son is the Word of God, and by active agent, it means the Spirit is how God moves in the lives of people to bring them to redemption. By denying the Holy Spirit, you're denying the opportunity for the Spirit to receive you into salvation. J.P. Holding of Tecton TV articulates this well. Third, the one who blasphemes the Holy Spirit is essentially one who denies the divine authority and activity of the Spirit, which is what the Pharisees did when they attributed Jesus' exorcisms to Beelzebub. And why specifically what Jesus said on this subject is attached to the story. In a nutshell, the Pharisees denied that the work of the Spirit through Jesus had divine authority or activity behind it. In other words, they didn't believe what they should have about it. The Christian scholar James Dunn put it this way. Now 
Now, in terms of today, after the resurrection of Jesus, you could apply this a couple of ways. Some would say that blaspheming the Spirit amounts to denying the Spirit's internal conscience-like product to become a believer. Or you could make it more broad and apply it to denying that the Spirit as God's active principle in the world actually exists and does things, like raising Jesus from the dead. Either way, the bottom line is the same. Unbelief. So this verse is not saying Jesus is less divine than the Holy Spirit. To deny the Holy Spirit simply means you deny the active agent of God and deny the internal changing powers of the Spirit. So basically, unbelief. The next verse skeptics say refutes the Trinity is 1 Timothy 2.5. They claim it shows Jesus is just a man and not God, since it says he is a mediator between God and us. So how can he be God if it says he's a man who mediates between God and men? Well, we have to remember what the entire verse is saying. If we conclude this verse says Jesus isn't God because he is the mediator, then he cannot be in the other party as well. So if being a mediator means Jesus can't be in one party, it also means he cannot be in the other party. Being the mediator is not an ontological claim, but a claim about one's task. Jesus is the mediator because he is fully God who became fully man as well, so that he would take on human nature to die for our sins. John Gill says concerning this verse, It was proper indeed that he should be man, that he might have something to offer, that he might be capable of obeying, suffering, and dying, and so of making satisfaction in the nature that had sinned. But then, had he not been God, he could not have drawn nigh to God on the behalf of men, and undertook for them, and much less have performed, nor would his blood, righteousness, and sacrifice have been available to cleanse from sin, to procure the pardon of it, justify from it, and make atonement for it, or make peace with God. So all in all, this verse is not an ontological claim that Jesus cannot be divine. Trinitarians affirm the hypostatic union and that Jesus is fully man. So the next objection is from 1 John 4.12, which reads, No one has ever seen God. If we love another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. Skeptics claim Jesus cannot be God because Jesus was obviously seen by people when he was on earth. But they claim this, is to take the verse out of context, since it is obviously referring to God the Father and not God the Son, since in verse 14 it says the Son was sent into the world. This is the exact same thing we see in John 1.18, which says, No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. So John is clearly speaking of God the Father in 1 John 4.12, and this is something we see throughout the New Testament. The writers constantly refer to the Son as Lord and the Father as God. Wayne Grudem says, The New Testament authors generally use the name God to refer to God the Father and the name Lord to refer to God the Son. This is seen in several places. This is not an ontological claim, but titles to differentiate between the two. At times the titles are switched to show that they are both God and Lord, but it is specifically mentioned. Generally the Son was referred to as Lord and the Father as God. But for the most part, the context of this is talking about how we do not see God but his love is in us, and we should display the love for all to see. Another verse I sometimes hear used against the Trinity, surprisingly, is John 1.1. 1, 1. Skeptics claim the original Greek in this verse shows the word is in God and is merely a God. In Greek, if there is no article before a noun, then at times when translating into English, you add an a or an an. So we often add an a depending on the grammar. Skeptics say the grammar shows we should do this in John 1.1, 1, 1, since this part has no article. Yet this part does have the definite article for the, when speaking of the word being with the God. So they say it should be rendered like this. Which shows the word is not the almighty God, but the word is just a God. So did John leave out the definite article for the in Greek on purpose, to show that there is a difference between the God and the word, who is just a lesser God? Well the problem is, this is a very simplistic view of Greek grammar. Dr. John Betchel points out John's structure of the verse like this, to show which word was the subject. In Greek, finding the subject of a sentence is done by looking at word endings. However, John 1.1 1, 1 is problematic, because both God and the word have the same ending. The usual way to handle a situation was to add the to the subject and leave it off the direct object, which is exactly what John did. Dr. Betchel says, To conform to the standard Greek grammar, E.C. Colwell demonstrated in an article in the Journal of Biblical Literature in 1933 that it was a normal practice to omit the in this type of sentence. John was simply using good grammar and making it clear that he intended to say the word was God rather than God was the word. The statement with some theological drawbacks. 
John constructed a sentence in the one way that would preserve proper grammar and sound doctrine, declaring that the word was God. This is what is known as Colwell's Rule. I tracked down the original article to read for myself and attached it in the information section below. If John wanted to say the word was a God, he could have easily done this by saying eis theos, as eis is the Greek word that is equivalent to the English article for a or an, but he doesn't because the word is God, not a God. Also, skeptics seem to forget that a few verses later in verse 18, John says no one has ever seen God and leaves off the definite article for the here. Yet it is clearly speaking of the Father. If John was intending to differentiate between the God and Jesus, just a God, then he should have rendered verse 18 with the definite article, but he doesn't because he's using proper grammar. Later in John 20, 28, John writes, Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. The original Greek uses the phrase, the God, to directly refer to Jesus and not the Father. So this theory is completely destroyed by context. John 1, 1 shows that Jesus is God and the verse is very Trinitarian. The last verse I want to look at is Revelation 3.14, where Jesus is identified as the beginning of God's creation. So how do Trinitarians respond? By simply looking at the original language. The Greek word for beginning is arche, which can refer to originating or active cause of creation, which would mean it says the same thing as John 1.3 and Colossians 1.15-16. Strong's Concordance points out this word has several meanings which include origin, the person or thing that commences, the act of cause, which are among other meanings. So this verse is showing that Jesus is the origin or act of cause of creation, the point from where creation begins from, not the first created thing. John MacArthur says, This corrects a heresy apparently present in Laodicea, as in Colossae, that Christ was a created being. Instead, he is the beginning, beginner, originator, initiator of creation. Since we are on the topic of the book of Revelation, it is interesting to see how much this book supports the idea that Jesus is God. The first chapter has Jesus speaking to John, calling himself the first and the last, which is the same title given to the Lord in Isaiah 48. Jesus also says he is the Almighty, which is the Greek word used for the personal name of God in the Septuagint. And we also see Jesus calling himself the Living One, which reflects the meaning of God's personal name, I am that I am, or the existing one as it appears in the Septuagint in Exodus 3. So Jesus once again affirms he is the eternal God, and most objections to Jesus' divine nature are clearly verses taken out of context and do not reflect the message of the Bible in context. It is affirmed over and over, Jesus is the eternal divine God, and those who say otherwise are clearly mistaken. Why didn't Jesus know the hour of the tribulation and the Olivet prophecies? In Mark 13, 32, Jesus says, But concerning that day, or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. In this verse, Jesus says that only the Father in heaven knows the hour when these events will happen. But this verse appears to contradict the doctrine of the Trinity. If Jesus is fully God, then shouldn't he know the hour as well? It appears as though he is less in ontological status to the Father and cannot have access to certain pieces of knowledge. However, there are possible answers to this. Most Christians respond to this by pointing out that Jesus was both fully God and fully man, and during his earthly ministries, prior to his resurrection, he willingly cooperated with the limitations of being human. He suffered hunger, he had to sleep and rest, and he felt grief and pain. Jesus was fully man, and yet he was worshipped to, forgave sins, and claimed divine eternal status with the Father. This is the hypostatic union. Christ had two natures, and during his earthly ministry, he cooperated with the limitations of being fully human. Of course this is because he is divine, who became fully man. Hebrews 2.9 says for a little while he was made lower than the angels, so that he could suffer death for everyone. Philippians 2.6-7 says, Jesus was equal with God, but willingly emptied himself and became human. So the scriptures teach us Jesus emptied himself, and thus suffered with the limitations of being human, which many surrendered properties like omnipresence and omniscience. This is seen in the fact that Jesus spent years learning and educating himself. And it also explains why Jesus didn't know the hour when that tribulation would occur. Jesus cooperated with the limitations of being human and wasn't fully omniscient. However, after his resurrection, he was once again in full glory with the Father and was omniscient and omnipresent. So this is the answer most Christians give. However, there are problems with this explanation. That is not to say that it's incorrect, just that it doesn't explain everything. The most notable is the fact that in Mark 13:32, Jesus says only the Father knows, 
But why not the Holy Spirit? If the Holy Spirit is fully God, then shouldn't he know as well? Why wouldn't Jesus say the Father and the Holy Spirit know the hour? Well, some have tried to answer this by suggesting that perhaps the Holy Spirit willingly limited his knowledge as well. But this almost seems ad hoc. Is there any answer a Christian can give on this? In fact, yes, there is. If we look at the entire passage this verse comes from in Mark 13 and Matthew 24, and if we look at the cultural context, a different picture emerges of what Jesus was actually alluding to. In ancient Jewish cultures, marriages were almost always prearranged. After arrangements were made, the young groom would begin building additions onto his father's house where he and his future wife would live. The custom was that the father of the groom would decide when the additions were finished and was ready for the young couple to move in, which meant only the father knew when it was time for him to get his bride. But this doesn't mean the groom actually didn't know when the time was. A wedding was a bigger event in those days than it is even today. It was a community-wide event. This meant people would have to plan for them far in advance and set aside time from their usual daily work. Dates would need to be known weeks before so people could adjust their work schedules for the wedding. Food would also have to be prepared in advance. There was of course no refrigeration or supermarkets, so arrangements for food needing livestock and crops were planned well in advance. Everyone would know when the time was getting close, as the traditional wedding food would need to be ready and prepared. However, despite it being obvious to everyone when the wedding would take place, in order to give respect to the father of the groom, it would naturally be said that only the father knows when the groom was going to get his bride. But obviously the groom would not have been unaware of the day or the hour, as it would have been obvious to everyone in the community. So with this in mind, a new understanding of Matthew 24:36 and Mark 13:32 can be seen. Jesus was not claiming that he or the Holy Spirit did not know the hour of his return, but was explaining to what the events leading up to the tribulation would be like. It would be like that of an ancient Jewish wedding, where everyone would know it's drawing near and the Father will give the word for it to take place. But the events leading up to it will be seen and understood by all. If we look at Mark 13:32 in context, we see it actually makes more sense with this understanding. Prior to saying this, Jesus gives another example of how we will know when the tribulation will take place. He says to learn from the fig tree. As soon as its branches put out its leaves, you know summer is near. So also, when you see these taking place, you know that he is near. Likewise, Jesus then gives another example by alluding that it will be like a Jewish wedding, when the father will give the word for his son to get his bride. So he borrows phraseology from a Jewish custom. So it is likely Jesus wasn't saying he truly doesn't know, but that he gives respect and authority to the Father to give the word when these things will happen. But he and the Holy Spirit would know, just like the community knows when the wedding will take place. As we said in our video which explains the Trinity, the doctrine of the Trinity says the Son and the Spirit submit to the Father's authority. Jesus was simply reiterating that here, and explaining the events leading up to the tribulation will be like that of the events leading up to a Jewish wedding. The Trinity Explained has become a pretty popular video. However, since I uploaded it, some objections have been raised. So in this video, I will answer some of the most used objections and end this video by strengthening the logical argument for the Trinity. I will not be dealing with objections from scripture as I've already done that in these videos. Now before I get started, some have said I'm comparing God to a cube, which is an out of context claim. What I'm saying is trying to explain God to man is like trying to explain a cube to a two dimensional being. Never once do I say God is like a cube. So moving on to real objections, some have objected with the idea that even though God is hyperdimensional, he can still just be a unitarian being. Well this is possible, but it doesn't metaphysically follow that God is also limited this way. Because something hyperdimensional has to have greater possibility than other things in lesser dimensions. This is the main point in my previous video, and here is that argument in a nutshell. God is greater than us in all properties. So humans have power, but God is greater by being all-powerful. Humans have knowledge, but God is greater by being omniscient. Humans can love, but God is greater that he is all-loving. Humans can only be Unitarian, so God therefore can also only be Unitarian? Well no, that doesn't make sense. God is greater than us in all properties and abilities. So he has to be greater than us in this ability as well, meaning he has the ability to be multi-personal. C.S. Lewis says, the human level is a simple and rather empty level. On the human level, one person is one being, and any two persons are two separate beings. Just as in two dimensions, say on a flat sheet of paper, one square is one figure, and any two squares are two separate figures. On the divine level, you still find personalities, but up there, you find them combined in new ways which we, who do not live on that level, cannot imagine. 
In God's dimension, so to speak, you find a being who is three persons while remaining one being, just as a cube is six squares while remaining one cube. Of course, we cannot fully conceive of a being like that, just as if we were so made that we perceived only two dimensions in space, we could never properly imagine a cube. But we can get a sort of faint notion of it, and when we do, we are then, for the first time in our lives, getting some positive idea, however faint, of something super personal, something more than a person. It is something we could never have guessed, and yet, once we have been told, one almost feels one ought to have been able to guess it because it fits so well with all the things we know already. So it doesn't make sense to say God is also Unitarian. He is greater in all properties and abilities. So many have asked, why isn't God more than three persons? Wouldn't it be better to be a million persons? Well, God could, but quantity in essence doesn't make something greater, because no matter how many eternal persons God is, He still is one omnipotent, omniscient God. Being more persons doesn't change that. What I said was, is the ability to be more persons is greater than the ability to only be one person. It is not about quantity, it is about the ability. So God can be as many eternal persons as He eternally wills. But Scripture says He is only three. Remember, this explanation is not supposed to explain all the ins and outs of the triune God. That would be impossible. It is merely to refute the claim that the Trinity doesn't make sense. Now moving on to the next objection, didn't God create space and time? If God created space and time, He must be independent of them. Therefore God cannot have spatial dimensions because God is spaceless and timeless. Well this is true, and I do not have a problem with this argument. Except that it is assuming that by me saying God is hyperdimensional, I am saying God is spatial, when actually, saying God is hyperdimensional is simply an analogous way to say God transcends space and time. Dr. William Lane Craig says, It is a commonplace of traditional theology that God exists extradimensionally, and that He transcends both time and space. So saying God exists hyperdimensionally is simply a way to say God transcends this world, and is not bound by the same rules we are. We cannot confuse something intended to be an analogous claim with an actual identity claim. Now to finish up, not only does the idea of a Unitarian God not logically follow in terms of dimensions, there are other logical problems with the concept of a Unitarian God. If God is not multipersonal, then perfect love is not an essential attribute of God. Perfect love can only exist between two or more persons, so until God created someone else, there was no love. This means God is eternally all-powerful, but not eternally loving. In power is at the essence of God, but not love. So when Unitarians say God is love, they are also saying God is dependent on His creation, since the only way God can love is if there is someone else to love. But that is absurd, because for God to be God, He must be dependent on no one, and everything must be dependent on Him. Only a multi-personal God is a morally perfect loving God and is dependent on no one or nothing. Also denying the Trinity creates problems in terms of Christian salvation. If Jesus isn't God and is just a created being, then should we pray to Him? The Bible clearly calls us to pray to Jesus, but if He isn't the omniscient, infinite God, can He truly answer our prayers? And are we to reject Paul's teaching to worship the Creator and not the created? We are also attributing salvation to a created being and not to God Himself. Is any created being who is by definition limited in power, knowledge, and love really able to take on the full weight of salvation and defeat sin and death? Doesn't scripture say salvation comes from the Lord, and never once does it say salvation can come from any created being? We also make God even less loving and powerful, being that He couldn't or would not willingly come Himself to save us, but instead sent a created being. This makes God distant and slightly apathetic towards us, since He only sent a servant to do something that is considered to be the most important and loving act in the history of mankind. So God becomes distant and unloving if He is only a Unitarian being. So looking back, we now see that the Trinity was not made up at the Council of Nicaea. It is in the Old Testament, obviously in the New Testament. Common objections have been dealt with, and it is logically valid, as indicated by this video and my previous one. So we can easily conclude that there is no reason to reject the teaching that God is complex in His nature and multi-personal.